Welcome to the IF's webinar on the Agriculture Water Infrastructure Program Stream 1 Producer Projects. My name is Alana Wilson and I'm a Program Manager with IAF. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge that IAF's office is in Victoria, the traditional territory of the Lekwungen First Nations, represented today by the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, and that IAF operates across traditional and unceded Indigenous territories throughout British Columbia. Today, I am presenting from the unceded traditional territory of the Sashat and Hupachesic First Nations. AWP is funded by the Government of British Columbia through the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and is delivered by IAF. I'm joined today by a few members of the BC government who will be assisting me during the Q&A period of the webinar today. First is Stephanie Tam, representing the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? For well, sure. I'm Stephanie Tam with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, located in the Abbotsford office, and I'm the water management engineer. Thanks, Alana. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, second, we have Ray Riley, a senior authorization specialist representing the Ministry of Water, Land, and Resource Stewardship. Would you like to say hello, Ray? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ray Riley, working for the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. I am a statutory decision maker under the Water Sustainability Act, uh, working out of the Penticton office. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And last, we have Ted Moore, a dam safety officer representing the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship to assist us with any dam related questions. Mm. Ted, would you like to give us an introduction? Hello, everyone. Yeah, Ted Moore, Dam Safety Officer for the Okanagan Region. Um, my office is based out of Merritt, and I'm happy to answer any questions that might arise. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for joining me today. So in today's presentation, we'll cover an overview of the program, a more detailed overview of Stream 1 and how to apply for Stream 1, and the presentation will be followed by a Q&A. The Agriculture Water Infrastructure Program aims to increase adoption of efficient irrigation infrastructure and improve agricultural water supply and management in BC. The program's goal is to improve water security in agricultural areas and food security in BC. AWP aims to maximize available water, increase agricultural production, and protect agricultural land from flooding. Funding for AWP is available through four funding streams, each with their own unique funding limits, eligibility requirements, and other details. Details about streams two and three is now available on IAF's website. More information on stream four is coming soon. And today we'll be covering the details of stream one producer projects. So let's get into stream one. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to encourage you to check out the AWP Stream 1 webpage for full stream details. Especially as we get into the activity slides, I'll be overviewing things in much less detail than there is online. So for the most complete source of information, please review the webpage. So Stream 1. Stream 1 will fund projects that increase agriculture water availability. Water storage infrastructure will be eligible where the water supply is currently unable to meet agricultural demand. The water supply is unlikely to meet demand under future climate change conditions and where upgrades are required to existing infrastructure. Each stream has their own unique funding limits, eligibility requirements, and other details. For stream one, the minimum funding is $200,000. This means that your project's eligible costs must be, a max, must be a minimum of $400,000 as the cost shared ratio is 50%. The maximum funding is $1 million, meaning that if your project costs exceed $2 million, you will only be reimbursed to a maximum of $1 million. To be considered eligible for Stream 1, applicants must be BC-based and must be an individual producer, such as the examples on this list. Please note that individual and indigenous producers who use water for a mix of agricultural and non-agricultural uses are eligible. Ineligible participants include non-agricultural entities, including aquaculture and seafood, 
provincial or federal governments, crown corporations, and several other types of non-producer entities listed here. Before we get into the eligible activities and costs, let's talk briefly about ineligible items. There are several ineligible activities and costs across activities. A condensed list is shown here. There are also additional ineligible items specific to each activity, which we will note in each activity overview. One ineligible item I want to highlight is irrigation systems funded under the Beneficial Management Practices Program. If you are a producer looking for irrigation infrastructure related funding, please see the BMP program web, web page instead. So what exactly is eligible under Stream 1? Within Stream 1, there are five eligible activities. Each activity relates to a type of water infrastructure. Activity 1 is for projects related to agricultural dams and reservoirs. Activity 2 for dugouts and related storage infrastructure, etc. Each activity has specific eligible costs and some specific ineligible items. So we'll be covering these one by one. Starting with activity one, which provides cost shared funding towards the rehabilitation and upgrade of agricultural dams and reservoirs. This includes dams with deficiencies where the owner has or has not been ordered to make repairs or lower the reservoir. These deficiencies are most often identified by the owner's consultant and they'll often provide recommendations on how to remediate the dam. Receiving an order does not disqualify an applicant. Please note that an assessment by the dam safety program is legally required before the work begins and when the upgrade is complete. If you intend to increase the size of the water storage, uh, you will also require authorization from the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Eligible costs under Activity 1 include construction costs like materials, machinery, and equipment, pumping systems and watering troughs to keep cows out of reservoirs, fencing if installed with a pumping system, and other professional services associated with project supervision. An activity-specific ineligible cost includes water distribution systems. Activity 2 provides cost-shared funding towards the improvement, expansion, or new construction of dugouts and related storage infrastructure for irrigation and livestock watering, including rangeland. This could include projects like installing dugouts in areas with low flow water supplies to enhance supply during times of shortage, lining of dugouts to improve water holding capacity, and installing pumps and watering troughs to improve livestock watering and protect stream health. Eligible costs under Activity 2 include construction-related materials, power supplies to farm property line, solar or wind power supplies, planting of trees or placing snow fencing, dugout aeration systems, pumping systems and watering troughs, fencing if installed with the pumping system or other professional services related to project supervision. Under Activity 2, Water distribution systems and dugouts that are legally considered dams are ineligible. Activity 3 provides cost shared funding towards the new construction of other water storage infrastructure. New water storage infrastructure will require authorization from the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Water use will need to be licensed for each purpose and any new storage infrastructure will require an engineering plan. Eligible costs under Activity 3 include construction-related costs such as machinery, equipment, or materials, pumping systems, and watering troughs to keep livestock out of the existing reservoir, um, provided the reservoir provides a secure water source in periods of drought, fencing if installed along with the pumping system, and other professional services associated with project supervision. Additional ineligible costs under this category include water distribution systems. Activity 4 will fund the improvement, expansion, or new construction of off-farm conversion of conveyance ditches to pipelines where savings of 30 to 50 percent can be achieved. Water demand is expected to increase with climate change, 
but adding water storage to supplement demand is not always an option. This activity supports projects which aim to use existing water supplies more efficiently, more efficiently, create new delivery systems to provide better water access and reduce conveyance losses and provide water to the farm through pipelines. Eligible activities and costs under Activity 4 include materials and construction for source development and mainline distribution systems, electric power line extension if required for an existing diesel pump or a new pump, other professional services associated with the project supervision. Activity specific ineligible costs include membership or share cost for tie-in to an existing pipeline, troughs, tanks, hydrants in the yard, livestock pens or barns, on-farm water distribution systems and back flood irrigation works. Activity five funds the improvement, expansion or new construction of water delivery systems to the farm gate from off-farm storage infrastructure and licensed intakes on stream. This includes expansion of water distribution systems. Eligible costs and specific ineligible costs for activity five are the same as activity four, which we just covered. So to review, eligible costs include materials and construction for source development and mainline distribution systems, electric power line extensions, et cetera. And activity specific ineligible costs include membership or share costs, troughs or tanks, on farm water distribution systems, et cetera. So that wraps up all of the eligible costs under each activity, which brings us to some of the regulatory requirements projects are required to meet. For all eligible activities, you will require a water license for the proposed use of the water source, such as irrigation from an aquifer or stream, a water license for the proposed storage volume and change approval to make changes in and about a stream if applicable to your project, as well as um, easements if applicable. Additionally, under activities one and three, applicants will require an assessment, approval, or authorization from the dam safety program. Applicants will be required to upload documentation showing how you meet these requirements within your application. And if you're wondering if you need a water license for a dugout, please review the authorizations requirements for storage and use of water in dugouts document, which is linked on Stream 1's webpage. In addition to the regulatory requirements, projects under Stream 1 must also comply with any pre-construction requirements that are applicable to the project. Each activity has pre-construction requirements these requirements often refer to assessments, studies, or design plans by qualified professionals. To give you an example of what this requirement looks like, imagine you're applying to upgrade a dam under Activity 1. You would require an engineering assessment or plan by someone who's qualified to make such a plan, such as an engineer with dam-related experience. This would need to be complete before you apply to Stream 1. And due to the wide range of professionals that may be applicable to the many different types of projects that are eligible under this program, IF does not provide a list of qualified professionals. Instead, applicants are encouraged to visit professional association websites to search for uh, folks who can provide the professional consultative services specific to the needs of the proposed project. For example, engineers and geoscientists of British Columbia, or the BC Institute of Agrologists. And please note, it's the professional ethics and responsibility of the qualified professionals to determine if their area of expertise or practice is best suited to the project. If you do not currently meet the pre-construction requirements, meaning you do not have an eligible assessment, study, or design as required by the activity you are applying under, you are currently ineligible for this stream. However, Stream 3 of AWP provides cost-shared funding towards those very plans and designs you may require. Check out Stream 3's webpage for more detail. Applications are currently open. Please note, you do not have to complete this plan or design through Stream 3 to access the other AWP funding streams. If you aren't sure what kind of 
assessment, study, or design, you will need to complete your project. The ministry has provided several resources to help you determine that. These include authorization requirements for storage and use of water and dugouts, guidance on farm water storage, BC Agriculture Water Calculator, BC Farm Water Dugouts, and you may also contact the Dam Safety Program for more details. The contents of these assessment studies and designs will heavily depend on the specific project activities you plan to undertake. Some examples include details about pipeline specifications, river crossings, water use requirements, dugout dimensions, and more. Detailed specifications and helpful links for each activity are available online. So that wraps up the details for Stream 1. Now that you have an idea of what you can apply for, let's talk about how to apply. Applicants can apply to AWP through the IAF client portal. Links to the portal are provided throughout IAF's website and are listed on the slide here. To find the application, log into your account and select the Funding Opportunities tab from the gray sidebar. It's noted in yellow here. And once on this page, scroll down to find the application button for the Agriculture Water Infrastructure Program. Once you've drafted and saved an application, it will appear under the Applications Draft Applications section of the portal, noted in blue here. Applicants to Stream 1 may apply through the IAF client portal. Applications are currently available to draft as of this morning. Applications can be submitted between July 25th and August 8th. Projects can commence as soon as they receive an approval letter from IAF, and projects should be completed within three years of the project start date. Applications will be reviewed and prioritized based on three criteria. The full prioritization criteria is now available online. Um, so the first criteria is water issues and supply source, will, which will be weighted at 30%. This includes a review of such things as the regulatory requirements, watershed risk, and water allocations. Project benefits will be weighted at 40%. This includes a review of the level of improvement to efficiency and storage, benefits to agricultural production, and whether the project is short, medium, or a long-term solution and technical review will be weighted at 30%. This includes a review of the project standards, whether a comprehensive project plan is provided, and if the project has reasonable anticipated outcomes. During your application to Stream 1, you will be asked to identify your watershed, which will be used to evaluate your application. On the website and application form, there's a link which takes you to a map indicated here, we are directing folks to an external site. We want to provide a brief overview of how to use the map provided. As you can see, there are areas of the map that are color coded, indicating watersheds and their priority. Tier one is red and includes watersheds where temporary protection orders have been issued. Tier two is yellow and includes watersheds where temporary protection orders have been contemplated. And tier three is pink and includes watersheds on the regional stream watch lists. And tier four is for all other watersheds not listed in tier one, two, or three. Tier four watersheds are not highlighted on this map. Thank you, everyone. That wraps up the presentation portion of the webinar, and we'll move on to the question and answer section. If you have a specific question you would like to discuss with the IAF team, please reach out to awp at iafbc.ca or find a link on the AWP webpage to book a consultation call. Please note that applicants should thoroughly review the program guide and draft an application before booking a consult call. These calls are meant to answer specific application-related qu questions based on your project. IF staff are not always able to answer all questions on a consultation call, as some questions are simply too technical and require us to consult with experts. If you have a technical question, if you have technical questions about your proposed project, please email them to awp at iafbc.ca. And depending on the question, IAF will work with technical advisors and various ministries to provide the most accurate answer. Okay, um, and with that, I'll begin our question and answers section. And it looks like we have a lot of questions rolling in. 
So our first question is, do we require an environmental farm plan to apply for AWP funding? And the answer to that is no. An EFP is not required to apply for AWP funding. Our next question is, how recent must our plan study be in order to apply? So this is a bit of a trick question. The recency of the plan study or design is not what determines whether it's a valid prerequisite document for stream one. Instead, your plan must still be applicable to the current situation or project. So if your assessment or plan or design is out of date and no longer accurate um, because things have changed, you would need a new assessment or plan to support your stream one application. Okay, can we apply if we are already funded for a project by IEF? So um, if you have received funding through another IEF delivered program, you can still apply to AWP as long as the activities are not the same as another project you've already received funding for. So essentially this means no double dipping. Um, however, if you've got a project and your new proposal would complement or build on or allow you know, previously started work to complete, then it may be eligible there. How are payments received if we're successfully funded? All projects will receive funding retroactively through this program. So this means you would be required to pay for the project upfront and provide, provide receipts during reporting, and then you'd be reimbursed for eligible costs at the stream's cost share ratio following your um, report submission. So depending on the project size and length, sometimes this is one report at the end of the project and one payment after the, that report's approved. However, sometimes these projects are quite large and expensive and we recognize it would be a challenge for applicants to, in some cases, pay up front um, for all costs and wait to be reimbursed. We understand that. So if needed, we can work with clients to set up multiple reports in order to have multiple payments during the project duration. So clients will still have to pay for the project costs up front, but this means that you can receive a partial payment, for example, halfway through the project, which would allow you to get some funding during the project as well to help ease the financial side of things. What does the pre-project value of irrigated area dollars annually refer to? So what we're looking for there um, from the applicants is for the applicants to provide what the, ir the revenue from the irrigated area is before the project is carried out. So what's your revenue pre-project for the irrigated area? If a farmer has a water license to store an amount of water, but the dam has a much smaller capacity, does the farmer still need permission from the Ministry of Water land and resource to expand their dam? Would they only require assessment completed by the dam safety officer? As we have two people on, on the call right now from that ministry, I'd invite Ray or Ted to jump in on this question, please. If I understand the question correctly, they've got a water license to store a certain amount of water, but they haven't been able to store that quantity of water because of some condition or shortcoming or whatever at the dam. Uh, now they're going to upgrade things at the dam to be able to store the water that they're already licensed for. Uh, if that's the circumstance, then they wouldn't need uh, an additional license for that. I'm looking to Ted here to, to jump in with the requirements for what they would need as far as the dam safety review or dam safety work. Yeah, you're correct, Ray. If they wanted to upgrade the dam structure, they would have to approach dam safety and submit a, a plan for review on that. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, they would have to hire a qualified professional to complete that plan. That plan would have to meet uh, our plan submission guidelines, which is on our dam safety site, as well as speak to you know the requirements under our Canadian Dam Association policies and best practices. When we get a submission to dam safety, we review it. That takes a, a bit of time, so uh, we ask that submissions are um, submitted early. Thanks, Ted and Ray. Um, that's great. I have another question about water licensing now. Water license applications are currently exceeding eight weeks for review and approval. So they're asking about what steps are possible to increase capacity, et cetera, to meet 
timelines to, to enable them to address current season water development constraints. Um, so is this something, Ray, you'd like to tackle regarding timelines for water licensing? Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess in a, in a generic sense, I could say that the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship has dedicated myself and one other staff person to working on these projects, these AWP projects as they come in. So the projects are not going to go in and sit in the queue with all of the other projects or all of the other water license applications or amendments that have come in. So we have a, uh, the province has recognized the importance of this project and the importance to the connections that it has to drought and to the sustainability and, and, and to increasing the capacity of, uh, of the overall agriculture industry. So they've dedicated us as staff to be doing this. Having said that, to have an application come in at this point and go through the steps that we have to go through, go through the consultation that Ted was talking about or possible uh, referrals to other agencies, and to have that addressed for this season right now would be very difficult. Thanks, Ted. And just to build on that question about water licensing, you'll see if you complete an application draft, there is quite a lot of questions about water permitting. You do not need to have all the permits in place to begin or submit your application. However, um, we do ask for tracking information, and there is also instructions provided in there regarding applications in progress to notify the Ministry of Water, Lands, and Resources if you're applying for this program as well um, to help identify those projects that are going to be working through this program as well. So the next question we have is regarding where was the link to the watershed map found? So a link to this map is located in the prioritization section of the AWP Stream 1 webpage. So you can find that map link on our webpage. And there's also a link in the application form itself to help you fill in that section of the application form. Okay. Um, we have a question about how long will it take for funding decisions to be available after the applications close? So we were, we're going to be working to provide decisions as soon as possible, ideally within 10 to 12 weeks of receipt of the completed application submission. But we really can't determine how long the technical review committee or a subsequent technical reviews will take to complete. So we will be working to get those funding decisions as soon as possible. But given the nature of these projects and um, how much review and follow-up questions there may be, we can't provide a clear time frame beyond that. Okay, I've got a question. Uh, will projects less than $20,000 be considered through Stream 3? Um, they won't. There is a minimum funding in place for this. The minimum uh, funding for Stream 1 funding is $20,000, meaning that projects must have minimum eligible costs of $400,000 at the time of reporting. So, if your project costs fall below that, your project may be at risk of cancellation. The stream does have a minimum. Somebody has just clarified, apparently I said 20,000 instead of 200,000. My apologies, the minimum is $200,000. So Alana, um, if I can jump in about the mm -hmm. minimum, within stream one, and stream three, that you could apply for multiple activities. So your total funding request is the total of all the activities that you want to put in the application. Thanks, Stephanie. That's a great clarification. I appreciate that. If I submit my application, but would like to make edits before the August 8th deadline, can I do that? So applicants cannot edit a submitted application in the portal. So while it's in draft, you can make edits. Once you hit that submit button and you submit it through the portal, you won't be able to make further edits. But if you do have that situation come up, please reach out to us and we will help assist you. Is there a way to get a loan from IAF to help with upfront costs? Unfortunately, no, we, we aren't able to do that. This is a cost shared program. So applicants would be required to find a way to um, get the other 50% cost share required for the program matching funding. 
while we uh, wait for some more questions, if Ted or Stephanie or Ray want to take this opportunity to clarify anything or provide any nuances based on anything you're being asked about this, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, maybe I'll take this opportunity just to talk about water licensing a touch and, and, and some of what we talked about earlier with the dams and dam safety reviews. In a water license, it describes the types of works that you have at the dam. If there's a dam safety review that suggests that those works need to be dramatically changed from what is on the license, then the license may actually need an amendment for a change of works. So I know the question before was, do, you, do we need any additional licensing? And my answer was, no, you don't need that additional licensing. But there may be a circumstance where if you're changing, say, the spillway uh, on one side of the dam to the other, or there's some significant change to the works where it wouldn't match what was still in the license, then there may be an amendment to that license that's required. So I did want to just, just clarify that. Thanks, Ray. And it's the same thing if somebody has a, a license that identifies a ditch and part of the project is to replace the ditch with a pipe to increase the efficiency of that conveyed water. If the pipe is traveling in the same location as the ditch, that should be fine. If you're thinking, well, we'll go a shorter way and we'll you know, take a different route, then that may require an amendment to your license because the license will show the location of the ditch. It may not show the location of the new pipe or the proposed pipe, or if the intake is in a different place. So there are situations where an existing license may need an application, uh, an application for an amendment, I mean. And you know, myself and the other technical review folks, when, when the applications come in, that's the stage at which we'll be hoping to catch those uh, those circumstances. Thanks, Ray. That's that's really helpful guidance. Okay, I do have another question here. Are further details about each requirement only found once an application has been opened? No, applicants are encouraged to visit our website to view the program guide, which will explain all of the requirements for each activity. Uh, would we need a license to extract water from a drainage ditch? Since I have the licensing specialists here, <laughs> please jump in. I'm going to say no, but it's a qualified no. Uh, I would want to see what the source of the water in the ditch is and where it is flowing and that sort of thing. So typically that would be a no, but with a, with a qualification there that, that, uh, that may be a circumstance. So we have one last question here. Do you cover the cost for producers to use their own equipment? Generally, no, that would be in-kind activities. So in-kind activities and the purchase of farm equipment and related accessories or attachments would not be eligible under this program. In-kind costs are not eligible for cost reimbursement through this program. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. So I want to thank all the panelists for joining me today, and I'd encourage everybody to visit the website, look at the program guide. There's links to a lot of these resources, as well as ways to follow up with contact information for the different government resources to get assistance and clarifications as well. And also, please reach out to us at IEF at awp at ifbc.ca, and our website for this program is also on that last slide. So. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And a reminder, this will be available online. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye.